Well, we start a brand new series this morning on the miracles recorded in the book of Acts. Now, we, we preached previously about the miracles of Jesus Christ in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, Jesus Christ, after dying and raising again from the grave, continued on performing miracles through his apostles. And so we know that Jesus Christ has not stopped performing miracles. Jesus, our sovereign Lord, has never stopped performing miracles. Still saves, still delivers. He's an awesome God. Amen. Praise God. I, I've been, I'm not going to preach the miracles in order in the book of Acts today. I'm going to let the Lord lead me as we can go and see some good things. Oh, we got a fun miracle today. Turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 9. And we're going to be looking at the last part of chapter 9. Now, in chapter 9, well, let's go back. In chapter 7, Stephen is stoned to death for preaching the gospel. First martyr of the church. Then in chapter 8, Philip goes down to Samaria. Great revival comes. Of course, there he's taken to um, Gaza and the uh, Ethiopian eunuch is saved. And then he's transported by God's power to another place. And then we find in after um, Stephen is stoned, after Philip goes down and preaches the gospel in Samaria and it spread abroad, then Saul in chapter 9, the first part, gets saved. Paul gets saved. Amen. And then we find in the 31st verse of this chapter 9 that rest came to the churches. No wonder. Amen. Get Paul out of the way and get him on board and get him on our side. No wonder rest came to the church of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to be looking at verse 36 of chapter 9 of Acts. To my knowledge, this is the first time Peter raised anybody from the dead. Now, I do believe that Peter raised a lot of people from the dead, but this is the one and only recorded instant where Peter raised a widow woman from the dead. And um, I'm thankful for the fact that that power still lives in the church. Apostle Paul also raised someone from the dead in the 20th chapter of Acts. And it's recorded the one and miracle of Apostle Paul raising Eutychus from the dead after Paul bored him to tears and he fell out a window and broke his neck because Paul preached a long, long time. And then Paul raised him from the dead. I'm not sure I'd have been that generous. But anyway, <laughs> but we're looking at a beautiful miracle that Peter, uh, of course, Jesus is the one that did this. And we understand before we begin our reading that there was a, a man down um, by the name of Aeneas down in Lydda where Peter went and he said that uh, Aeneas had been bed fastened for eight years. And when, Jesus, when Peter got there to um, Lydda, he said to Aeneas had been in bed for eight years crippled. He said, um, Aeneas, Jesus Christ, healeth thee. And he arose from the bed, and as did, and there was a great revival began to penetrate the city of Lydda. Now, look at verse 36, and let's stand for the reading of God's Word. This is an awesome miracle. This is a tremendous miracle. This is an exciting, thrilling, wonderful, fun miracle. This is a fun miracle. When you look at the details, this is a fun miracle. You say, well, aren't all miracles fun? No. Ananias and Sapphira were stricken dead for lying to the Holy Ghost. That was not fun for them. And I guarantee you it wasn't fun for those who had to drag him out of the church and go bury him out behind the churchyard. So not all miracles are fun, but this is a fun miracle. Verse 36, and we're going to read down to the rest of the chapter, and we're going to see Peter in action by the power of Jesus Christ. Holy Ghost miracles continue. Verse 36, now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which my interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and she died, whom when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber 
And for as much as Lydda was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men, desiring him that he would, would not delay to come to them. Peter arose and went with them, and when he was come uh, to them, when he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by him weeping and showing the coats and the garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed and turned, turning him to the body, said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and lifted her up, and when he, was, when he called the saints and the widows presented her alive. And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord, and it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon a tanner. I want to use for a subject this morning Peter's Tabitha miracle. It's an incredible miracle. You may be seated. She's a widow. Um, she, is a, uh, she is ministering to many widows. And um, we know that, well, I say that Tabitha is a widow. She ministered to widows. Tabitha may have been a fairly young person. I don't know how old she was and don't know much about her. Some said that they think that Tabitha was very rich. Well, I doubt that because the description says she made clothes. If she was very rich, she'd have bought clothes. Amen. And the Bible says that she made, she gave alms. In other words, the alms that she gave were done through her labor. And she was an outstanding lady. Let me just say real quickly, she ministered to the widows. Uh, I'll just say this as a footnote to our church. If you're interested in helping with the Doves ministry, it's to the widows of our church. And we have several widows in our church and also several widowers in our church, men and women, that their loved ones have gone on, their spouse has gone on to be with Jesus Christ. If you'd like to help in that Dove's ministry, I'd like to see that get sparked and going again, and I'd like to see some helpers with that. And so if you're interested in helping with that, get with me after the service this morning, or call and let us know that you want to be a part of the Dove's ministry. Now, I've said that. I just want to say that Tabitha was a very interesting lady. In fact, she had two names. Tabitha was her Aramaic name, Hebrew name. Dorcas was her Greek name. Now, her name, Tabitha and Dorcas, means the same thing. It means a, a gazelle or a deer. And a lot of people named their girls after the roe, after the deer, because of its graceful ability to bound and to leap and beauty, beautiful animal. I think that the Missouri um, white-tailed deer is one of the prettiest animals on planet Earth. Have you ever watched one of them jump a fence? Oh, they just walk up to the fence, look at it like that, and they go right over, and their body just curves and boom, right down into my melon patch. I mean, just incredible animals, beautiful animals. And if you've ever watched a, a, a deer uh, here in Missouri jump a fence, then you know that they are so graceful, so beautiful, so amazing. Now, if I climbed over a fence or jumped over a fence or crawled through a fence or under a fence, it would not be graceful. It would be pitiful. And you would be extremely sad for me. And then you'd be extremely sad for the fence that I tore up in the process of being bloodied up and scratched up. But Tabitha was a unique person. She um, did alms. The scripture in verse 36 says alms deeds, meaning that she worked, made money to give to people who needed money. She labored. I don't think she was a rich person. I believe that she worked hard. She got Finances, she got ability, alms deeds, and she worked hard. I want to, and, and the Bible says she died. In the middle of her working for the Lord, she dies. 
and they wash her and put her in an upper room. After washing her and putting her in an upper room, they had heard that Peter was in Leda, and so they sent two men to go get Peter and bring Peter back to Joppa, same place that, you know, Jonah went down to get a fare of Joppa to go to Tarshish, same, same Joppa. And someone said, well, where did, where did uh, how did um, Tabitha get saved? Well, I believe she probably was saved through the church ministry of Philip, who went down and preached in Samaria. That was Samaria area. But she, she was very involved in helping people. And she sewed garments. She took this Tabitha, and she dies. Well, when she dies, they put her in an upper room. Don't miss this. This is incredible. They wash her. They didn't embalm her. They didn't even prep her for burial. They just washed her clean. Because they heard that the man named Peter, who walked with Jesus Christ, who walked on the water, the man who, called, who is called Simon Peter, the apostle Peter, that great Peter that walked with Jesus, that Jesus said, you're a rock. They knew that that Peter who walked on water, that Peter who ran to the empty tomb of Jesus Christ where Jesus uh, rose again from the grave, they knew that that Peter that was on Mount Transfiguration with their Lord, they knew that that Peter was in Lydia and in Lydia he healed a man by Aeneas that was bed fastened and they put uh, Dorcas, Tabitha up in the room Someone said, well, why did you give her, why did their mom and dad give her two names so they could remember them? Sometimes I wish my kids had two names so I could remember them. But, but uh, Tabitha, uh, they put her up in the upper room. They send two men to go get Peter and bring Peter to um, Joppa to where Tabitha was laying in the upper room. Now, before I get too far ahead in the message, and this is an exciting miracle. Let me begin by preaching a little bit to you. Tabitha was full of good works and alms deeds. Notice the three words that are used at the end of verse 36, which she did. The Bible says that Tabitha, who was by Greek name Dorcas, was a disciple. She not only was a disciple of Jesus Christ, and when, that, when we say disciple, we're not saying that she was an apostle. We're just saying that she was a follower of Jesus Christ. And she was a disciple, and she was full of good works. I love the phrase, full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. Now, there's people in this room that your head's full of good works. I'm not going to do this. I've got things, I, you know, I really ought to go down there and help that person. No, I really ought to go visit that person who's been sick. No, I really ought to do this. Your mind is full of good works. But notice she said, which she did. The Bible says, which she did. You know, just think about it. It's not good enough. You need to do it. Amen? Which she did. She did great things. And there may be someone in this room right now, you planning on doing some good things. That's not going to work. You've got to hear the, the word which she did. You got to remember she did it. She didn't just have full, she wasn't just full of good works or good ideas or alms deeds. She did it. She did what God had led her to do. The sad thing is in verse 37, she gets sick and she dies. And they wash her and took her up, verse 37, up in an upper room. Now, someone would say, why did they wash her and why did they put her in an upper room? Someone would say, well, that was just a custom in that day. Well, it may have been, but you hear what I'm having to say. This was people that knew the Old Testament and they remembered in 1 Kings, a prophet by the name of Elijah, that a widow of Zarephath had a son that died. And Elijah took that dead son in his arms went up into the upper room, laid that, ba- that child on a bed, and did some unspeakable things and raised that boy from the dead. They knew that. They also knew that a man named, by the name of Elisha, uh, a Shunem woman, had a boy that got sick and died. And when Elisha come home, 
He was living in the upstairs in the upper chamber of the house they had made for him. And when Elisha come home, you know what that woman had done? She laid that dead boy in Elisha's bed. Now that's something to come home to. Hello? That's really something to come home to. And, and I believe that these, these um, disciples of Jesus Christ, when, when Tabitha died, they took her to the upper room. Because I believe they were expecting the Peter down there in Lydda would come. And they sent two men to go get Peter. Peter doesn't realize that there's a trap being set for him. He doesn't realize, boy, is he going to be in hot water if he doesn't perform. And they sent two men down to Lydda to bring Peter back. Not only did they send those two men, they, they didn't send just word for Peter to come. But notice in verse 38, they sent and went for Peter, two men. Now, these two men... I don't think they were riding donkeys because donkeys are too stubborn to go too many places too long. Donkeys are pretty slow. I doubt if they were riding horses because the church at this time was relative poor and they usually walked everywhere they went. And so more than likely these two men that were sent didn't go horseback. If they did go horseback, they rode them hard and put them up wet. And they rode them fast because you see, uh, there in Joppa to Lydda was 10 miles. And so they put Tabitha in an upper room. Peter's 10 miles away. And they say to two men, go get Peter. Don't delay. Go get him. We've got to get Peter here while she's still warm. Before she stiffens up. We've got to get Peter here before she's put in the grave. We've got to get Peter here before we have to bury Tabitha. And so they make their journey. I think these two men were probably runners. And they ran, and they ran, and they ran. And I'm told that one man can make a journey of about um, eight miles in four hours. For me, that would be 20 hours, eight miles, with three stops overnight. If I was running... 10 miles. But these men ran 10 miles. When they got to Lydda, they found Peter and they said, Peter, you've got to come. Don't delay. You've got to come. I can just hear them say to Peter, you've got to come. There's a bunch of women up there in the upper room and they'll kill us if we don't bring you with us. You see, them women were charged up. They knew that God could perform a miracle. Now, some people will say, well, you know, that, that, they, they, you don't know that them women were expecting a miracle. Well, why did they put her in the upper room? Why did they wash her and make her presentable for Peter? Amen. They didn't know for sure what Peter was going to do, but they weren't going to limit God. They wasn't going to limit the power of God. And so Peter comes, I love this, he comes with them without delay. And when he gets there, they take him to the upper room. And when he gets up in the upper room, guess what he sees? The upper room has become a showroom. The upper room has become a showroom. The women have got the coats, the sweaters, the clothing, and they're showing them all to Peter. That's all Peter needed to see a garment show. And Peter comes in, and, and, and it kind of indicates that maybe they didn't just show the garments to Peter, but they also, some of them had the garments on. They modeled. They showed, this is what, this is what Dorcas made for me. And, and I guarantee you, Peter knew better than to say, that looks dorky. <laughs> no, it looks Tabithy. It looks Tabithy. Amen. Beautiful. Amen. Pardon the pun. I know that was totally unnecessary. But I doubt if there's one person in this room named Dorcas. If there is, I'm dead. But anyway, I need to call Peter quick. But Peter goes into that room and there's a showroom. Let me, let me just quickly say, they showed Peter, verse 39, and Peter arose and went with them and brought him into the upper room. And all the 
widow stood by him weeping, showing the coats and the garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. Let me say this. Your life is a showroom. Your life is a showroom. They showed Peter all the things that Tabitha made with her hands. That upper room became a showroom. And let me tell you this real quickly. When you get sick enough to die, or you die, your showroom will shine the brightest at that hour. Amen. If you're busy making a living, people tend to forget you. If you get sick for a long, long time and put away in some you know, home, people tend to forget you. But if you suddenly are stricken with sickness like Tabitha and suddenly die, your showroom becomes brilliant, bright, incredible. And you will never be more appreciated after you're dead than you are while you're living. That's sad, but that's the generation we live in. I got to thinking about how they... um, how Tabitha made garments and things for the widows because they were poor. The, the church of Jesus Christ was extremely poor. And I got to thinking about how she made sweaters and, and, and you know, jack, uh, coats and, and clothing for the widows. Th- that don't seem like a big deal in, in, our, in, in our nation, America. That doesn't seem like a big deal. But the generations before us knew what it was like to make their own clothing. The generations before us knew what it was like in the Great Depression. The generation now, the generation just passed and the generation we live in now knows nothing about sacrifice like this. They know nothing about it. They can go down to the store and buy their clothes. Let me say this. The generation just passed and the generation now doesn't understand this miracle where she made garments for the widows. But we will. The generation coming will understand this miracle. Absolutely. We've been kind of sheltered. There's other countries in, in the world that this, is, this miracle means more to them. Because it doesn't mean a lot to America because we've been spoiled with water in our faucet tap in the kitchen. We've been spoiled with running water in our bathroom. We've been spoiled with going down to Walmart and buying whatever we need to buy. We've been spoiled with going to wherever to buy clothes, Sears and Roebuck. I guess Sears is gone. But anyway, Montgomery Ward. Oh, that's gone too. Uh, but Kmart. Oh, that's gone too. Well, Walmart ain't gone. I guess it ain't going nowhere. But anyway, we go buy some clothes. And, and of course, those of you that are really, you know, I mean, you're just, you know, you're too good to buy clothes at Walmart. You go to some place that's called Tiger or I don't know what they call them. Some of you women can help me here. Coles? What's some more of them? Huh? Pennies? Dillard's? Does Dillard's even exist? Is it still around? Well, see, you go to the fancy place. My wife has learned that you can go to Pennies and do coupon stuff, and, you can, and when they send you a gift, they don't really think you're going to use it. They think you're going to show up at Pennies and buy a bunch of stuff with the gift. My wife walks in there with the gift card, and that's all she gets. Why? Because my wife is a tightwad. My wife grew up as a little girl in Galena where they were still piping electricity to her. My wife, as a little girl, lived in Galena when they had a three-hole-seater outhouse. My wife remembers as a child, no TV, no telephone. I'm telling you, my wife is old. (laughs) She remembers Audie, her dad, listening to the radio, um, what was it, Buck Rogers or Roy Rogers or whatever on the radio. And, And so my wife remembers those things. And so she's a little more peach and penny than some people. Money will spoil us if we don't have priorities right. And money has literally spoiled rotten the United States of America. Those things are changing, though. I feel a change in the air, don't you? Amen? And so... uh, Tabitha has made these garments, and Peter's thinking... How do I get out of this? Peter's thinking, okay, this woman's named Tabitha, 
And Peter's thinking, okay, I'm going to do what my Lord did. Get out of the room. He put them out. Just like in Mark chapter 5, remember, Josh's daughter. Remember, Jesus put them all out. And he was in that room with uh, uh, Talithia, I believe was the name. And he pray, uh, Jesus didn't pray, but he speaks to Talithia Kumai, rise, and she arose. And Kumai means little maid, little, uh, little lady, rise. And, and so Peter's thinking, well, you know, uh, Talithia is pretty close to Tabitha. And so his wheels are starting to turn. Well, I'll do what Jesus did. And so he puts them out of the room, and he kneels down in praise. Now, you say, well, Jesus didn't kneel down and pray. No, because he'd been talking to himself. He'd already talked to the Father. He already had power. But Peter needed to make sure that he could hear from the Lord. And so Peter bows down. He turns the showroom into a prayer room. Hear me. Peter turns the showroom into a prayer room. And Peter puts them out, verse 39. And there he, he prays, um, verse 40 rather, Peter puts them out, all forth and kneels down and prays. And he, he turning to the body said, Tabitha, arise. Or Tabitha, kumai, little lady, arise. But he didn't do it. Until he prayed. Now, why was Peter praying? He was praying because he wanted to know if it was God's will if this woman got up from the dead. I mean, no, that woman was already in the presence of Christ. That woman was already in heaven. I would think that you ought to get on your knees and say, now, Lord, I don't want to interrupt anything going on up there. I need to know for sure that it's okay to raise her up down here. And so Peter prays and seeks the will of God. And then he hears from the will of God. And when he hears from the will of God, he says, Tabitha, arise. Open, and she opened her eyes, verse 40, and she sat up. Verse 41, he gave her his hand, lifted her up, and called the saints and the widows And he presented her alive. Isn't that a beautiful story? They presented her alive. I love that. They presented, Peter presented her alive. They presented to Peter clothing, sweaters, coats that Tabitha had sewed. She died. The showroom was on. Don't misunderstand me. Everybody ought to have a showroom, but it should be dedicated to the Lord. It should be humble. I didn't say everybody should have a showy room. Everybody should have a showroom. When you die, your showroom will light up, and people remember the good things you've done. Until then, you're just going to have to take for granted that God's a good God, and what you need to do is not let your right hand know what your left hand doeth. You need to just be concentrate on the things of the Lord. And so we do things. We're, we're getting our showroom ready. Peter, they presented to Peter clothing that she had sewed. But Peter presented to them Tabitha that made the clothes. He, he raises Tabitha, Jesus does, raises Tabitha from the dead. Peter walks her to the door, calls the widows and the saints, and presents her to the the. Um, Saints of God presents Tabitha alive. Amen? Hello? Isn't that good? How many would agree that that is an amazing thought when you stop and think about it? How God has used this woman and how Peter raises her from the dead and presents her to the church and and she's alive and well. Presents her alive. You know... I've thought about this. You know, always before, Peter kind of put words in Jesus' mouth. You know, when they're on Mount Transfiguration, remember? Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Elijah, and one for Moses. What in the world does Jesus, Moses, or Elijah need a shack for? Straw sheds. And God interrupts with a cloud and says, shut up, Peter. 
Well, he didn't use those words, but he said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Remember, Jesus Christ says to Peter, I'm going down to Jerusalem and die. And Peter says, no, you're not. I rebuke you, Lord. You're not. And Jesus whirls around on his heels and says, I rebuke you in the name of of the devil. You, you, the devil's in you. I rebuke you because you have a devil in you. And Peter sold up like a kick possum. So he always tried to put words in Jesus' mouth. Let me say to you, why don't you quit trying to lead Jesus around and let Jesus lead you around? Most of our prayers are meant to lead Jesus around. You need to get on your knees and find out what God wants in your life and let Jesus lead you around, not you lead him around. What we want to do is we want to lead God around. When God says, no, 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 you, I don't lead well. God's God. He doesn't lead well. He says, you follow me, and he blesses well. I was praying this morning, early this morning here in the church, and I said, God, please be merciful and kind and gracious to our church. And all of a sudden, I just felt like God put a fist in my stomach and said, don't talk like that. And I said, wait a minute. We need mercy and grace and, and kindness to our church. And the Lord says, that be like someone telling you before service, now, pastor, be gracious and kind and merciful as if I'm not going to be. Amen. That changed my whole prayer today. In fact, that knowledge has changed my whole prayer life. God is sovereign. God is a good God. We don't lead him. He leads us. Yes, we ask for forgiveness, not because God won't give it, but because we need it. Yes, we ask for grace, not because God won't give it, but because we need it. And we need to be careful not to give God a, you know, a, a, a courteous, sweet scolding. Now, God, be nice. God, be merciful. God, be kind to me today, as if God isn't already. We know God is a good God. Every good and perfect gift coming down from above, from the Father of lights. We know God is a good God. You say, what? Well, God is a sovereign God. God is a, a, a God of providence. God is a mighty God. God is a judging God. Yeah. But we know what to expect out of God, don't we? It isn't like unexpectedly God's going to send a lightning bolt out of heaven and burn us all up for a barbecue on Sunday afternoon. It's not like God's going to do that. God says, you know what I'm going to do. I'm slow to anger. You know what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you every chance in the world to repent of your sins. You know what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you every chance in the world to do right. I'm slow to anger. But you know what I'm going to do. Eventually, I'm going to judge. Not because I'm a bad God, but because I'm a holy God. Not because I'm a, a, a mean God, but because I'm a just God. Changed my whole prayer life. This literally changed my whole prayer life. And I said, God, I'm sorry I talked to you that way. Talk, talk to God like he's a little child going off to school. Now, you be nice now. You be merciful. You be kind to people now. And, and, and God says, what? Do you really have to ask me to do that? Well, yeah, I need to ask God to forgive me because I'm a sinner. I need to ask God for mercy because I need mercy. I don't deserve it. But I don't need to give God a lecture on why he should be kind to me because that's his order. Amen? Well, that's good preaching. Whether you like it or not, that's just good preaching. And so remember, we need to quit trying to lead God around. Peter tried to lead Jesus around. But Peter learned a lesson in this miracle. He comes to that room. Then women are showing all this stuff. Peter didn't know Tabitha. He didn't know Dorcas, same lady. He didn't know her. Peter probably didn't know them people in that upper room. But they knew him. And they were expecting Peter to do something. And Peter walks into this room and says, well, now, wait a minute. I'm on a spot here. Uh, 
what I do, you know. And I don't know exactly Peter's prayer, but when he put them all out, they didn't see Peter pray. They didn't see Peter pray. The Scripture records that he prayed, but they didn't see Peter pray. He got on his knees and talked to God. They didn't see that. They didn't know what went on in that room. All they know is Jesus, Peter presents Tabitha alive. And I think Peter's prayer was something like this. Boy, I'm in a spot, Lord. <laughs> Lord, I would really appreciate if you'd get me out of this. I believe Peter's prayer went something like this. I'm in a spot, Lord. Because I got to know if it's your will that, I raise, that she raised from this. And, and, and I don't even know if I can do it. And Peter's thinking, well, I got to get the mind of God. And while he's praying, he probably, it probably, you know, Mark chapter 5 probably came back to him. Well, this woman's got a name, Talakuma, uh, Talithia, kind of like Tabitha. The setting's kind of like what it was when you raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. And so Peter said, okay, okay, it's looking better. And Peter prays and talks to the Lord, and God says, you got to go ahead. The Lord speaks to Peter and says, you got to go ahead. You quit trying to lead me around, and now you're letting me lead you around. You've got to go ahead, Peter. And Peter goes, <laughs> and he says, Tabitha, arise. And it worked. She got up. She saw Peter. Peter takes her to the door, walks her to the door, and presents her to the saints and to the widows alive. You want to learn to start presenting some things to the church in a humble way? You got to quit trying to lead the Lord and let the Lord lead you. Amen? We can't lead the Lord. The Lord must lead us. And Peter gets on. And by the way, this is the first uh, to my knowledge in the scripture, this is the first p person Peter ever raised from the dead. In fact, it's the only one recorded. I think he did many more after that that wasn't recorded. But I, and by the way, Peter didn't raise her from the dead. Jesus did that. You, you do understand that, don't you? Hello, you do understand that Peter was just a voice. Jesus Christ is the acts. You know, it's not the acts of the apostles. It's the acts of the Holy Ghost. It's still the acts of Jesus Christ. In the book of Acts. And he raises this woman, Jesus does, to Peter. And Peter walks her to the door and says, I want to present to you Tabitha. And Tabitha may have said to Peter, whoa, don't, don't take me out there yet. i got to put something nice on. And Peter said, oh, man, hurry up. You're not the only man that's had to wait on a woman. And that woman probably said to Peter, I'm not going out there until I put on something more presentable. They'd already washed her and made her hair, and she, you know, she looked pretty good in that way, but she was covered. And, and Peter said, oh, come on. You know how to change? Come on. She said, nope, not leaving until I put something on more presentable. Peter says, all right. He walks over to the corner of the room and stands in the corner while she's getting dressed. The big apostle Peter standing in the quarter. Well, Tabitha is getting dressed. He said, I don't say that in the Bible. No, but it's good preaching. <laughs> and it's very possible. If I know women, it's absolutely possible. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Put yourself in Tabitha's shoes and you just raised from the dead and they washed and did your hair and probably didn't do it the way you thought it ought to have been done. And you get raised from the dead and think about what you would do. You would say to Peter, I ain't going out there. You are not going to present me like this. I'm going to put something on, something suitable. And so Peter presents her to the saints to the church, to the widows. Because she's now presentable. <laughs> Never mind the fact that she was dead, now she's alive. No, she's presentable now. It's one thing to be dead, and it's another thing to be presentable. 
Hello. So let me close with this little thought about this miracle. And, and, and I want to circle back around to this because this is all important. Every one of you are building a showroom. You may not be doing it with needle and thread like Tabitha, but every one of you are building a showroom. It's a memory hall. It's a memory room. No one's going to pay much attention to it while you're living. They might show some attention to it while you're sick, about to die. But your memory room and your showroom will never be the brightest. It will be ever so bright upon your death. When you leave this earth, your showroom will shine the brightest. It's then where people say, well, I knew them. I knew her. She was a lovely lady. I knew her. She loved the Lord so much. She went to church. I know her. She was an outstanding Christian woman. And the showroom is being talked about. The widows, the saints are talking about how good the person was. Never mind while she was living. <laughs> Keep sewing. You Can you make me a, 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 what do they call them, doilies or whatever that? Can you make me one of them? Can you make me a blanket? And my mother-in-law made a lot of blankets. And Sister Janet White made a lot of potholders and sweaters, and she, she would knit. And she'd come to church, sit back there and knit while I'm preaching. I used to take offense with that. I used to think, Lord, there's an old woman, there's a young woman back there in the back of the church. She's knitting while I'm trying to preach. And the Lord says, I know, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> and I said, Lord, she's knitting while I'm preaching. He said, she's hearing more than most of them. Most of them's on cell phones. Most of them wish you'd shut up so, you'd, so they could get out of the church. You rushed here this morning to get here so you wouldn't be late, and now you want out. I'd never seen a group of people that comes to church eager to get here and then want out so quick. What's your hurry? And Janet used to do those knitting. After she died, everybody showed them. But while she was living, not much said. Other than, Lord, there's a woman back there knitting while I'm trying to preach. My mother-in-law, Eva, used to make blankets. And she would make these blankets, beautiful blankets. And um, the, girl, the wife and the girls would say, oh, that's so pretty, Gran Granny. Called her Granny. That's so pretty, Granny. And then she'd show it to me. And I'd say, oh, yeah. 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 That's probably how Peter felt. Oh, yeah. Just what I wanted to see, some sweaters and clothes. Women's at that. And Eva would show me the blankets. They didn't mean nothing to me, but after she left, I looked at them blankets, and I thought, boy, that was a talented lady. Beautiful blanket. A lot of people don't remember the person that makes the blanket till after the person is gone. It's called the showroom. Amen? It's a showroom. The apostles, the apostles were killed. Jesus Christ said the prophets were killed. And after they were killed, then they whitewashed their sepulcher because they thought they were such wonderful men. But when they were living, they despised them, rejected them. But after they died, they made them saints, heroes. But you know, you got to give people something to work with. Hello. Please. Give some people something to work with. Amen? Now, some of you didn't get that yet. When you die, do enough good things, the preacher don't have to lie. Amen. When you die, live a life for Christ in such a way the pastor doesn't have to say, She's in heaven now, and in the back of his mind saying, I hope so. <laughs> the greatest gift that you can ever give your children, Mama, the greatest gift you could ever give your children, Daddy, the greatest gift you could ever give to your grandchildren or your friends is the gift that they know where you go. Amen. They know that you're a child of God. That's the greatest gift you can give your anybody that they know 
beyond a shadow of doubt that they've gone to heaven. And leave them a nice showroom. Amen? See, we're not supposed to be showy in this life. But once we die, it doesn't matter. God gets the glory. Amen? And so we want to have the showroom. So people, you know, when so, and I'm sure many of you can relate to this. You hear someone dies. It's sudden. Shocks you. Literally shocks you. You hear someone suddenly die. Just shocks you. This is like Tabitha. Just shocks you. And immediately their showroom begins to brighten up. And you begin to say, oh, they love church. They love to sing. They love to pray. They, they made some of the best banana pudding in, in church potlucks. Amen? See, we want to, and we don't have no bad cooks in our church. We got good cooks. The men stay out of the business. Well, I shouldn't say that. We got some men that can cook really good. Kind of sissy, but they can cook. <laughs> I'm teasing. But anyway, you know, you got them potlucks, and they make that food, and, and it's all good. I haven't got one bad dish ever at one of our potlucks. They are tremendous food. I'm, I'm trying to justify myself in what I'm about to say. You don't want to get a hold of a pot and take a spoon and pop it in your mouth and go, oh, ooh, 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 hold on, and run to the trash can. <laughs> That's not the pot you would want your name on. So when they, when they remember you, if you die, they need to remember you, oh, you made the best pineapple turnover cake. You made the best gooseberry cobbler. You made the best cake, or you made the best pot roast. You made the best whatever. They want to remember that. And not only that, you went to church. You loved the Lord. You were a woman of prayer, or a man of prayer. You dedicated to the things of God. That's the showroom, showroom you need. It's not, I wish they're there. It's, I know they're there. And it's, you know, I, you know it's, sad. it's sad that when people leave the room, the only time the room lights up is when people leave the room. I'm sure all of you have had that relative that you just wish would not show up. I'm sure all of you had that relative that you wish was in the basement with a padlock. In fact, some of you probably got someone down there now. You got to get back home just to feed them under the steel door of the basement. And we don't even know that it's your uncle or your aunt <laughs> or your mother-in-law or your father-in-law. Amen? My son-in-law tells me, I'm going to wait till you get old and put you in a nursing home. That's what my son-in-law says to me. That ain't going to happen. They'll be putting pampers on you before I get pampers. <laughs> Just so you don't forget what son-in-law that is, Cody. <laughs> He's not here right now. Cody Rogers. <laughs> the man who stole my daughter. Charity. Akins stole her and stole her name. Amen. Yeah, okay, I've got to quit. But this is a fun miracle, isn't it? It's a fun miracle. We can leave things behind. We can remember people. Amen. I think of people that's gone on, and I'll not go into names because, you know, I, recent ones that's gone on, like Dan Sandoval, a great friend of mine. And I could go through many beautiful qualities of that man, and I miss him. I can go through others that's left the church, little Anna. What a precious girl. I mean, when she first started coming here, she'd bound around like a young teenager. She picked up 10 acres of rocks here at the church. Well, J.R. watched. <laughs> He's not here, so I can say that. <laughs> J.R. and Anna always worked. You know what J.R. and Anna always did? This is what they always did. To my knowledge, J.R. has never preached a sermon. To my knowledge, Anna never preached a sermon. But they never missed church. They always supported church. And when they heard someone was sick... They always visited the sick. 
When someone died, they always went to their home. And I always made a dish to take to someone who lost a loved one that's gone on to heaven in the home. J.R. and Anna never did any pre. They just show up in the house of grieving people. I knew that J.R. and Anna would always be there for those that were in grief. That's the showroom. That's what you remember people by. You remember people by not what you own, not what you possess in riches. You remember people by what you've done. In good deeds, in alms deeds giving, in giving, in good works. That's where they'll remember you. Isn't that good? Now the miracle didn't get so fun now. It's kind of lost its fun. We're going to give an invitation. Josh is going to come bring a song. Tonight we're going to be in the book of Acts, first chapter, first verse. Going to be awesome. How many would agree that this is a fun miracle? This is a fun miracle. And this is the first person that I, that's recorded that Peter raised from the dead, that Jesus used him to raise from the dead. What a miracle. Peter's Tabitha miracle. And by the way, some of you could use that same miracle. Oh, I don't mean you're going to be raised from the dead if you go to heaven. I mean, you can have that same Tabitha miracle. When you are gone, you've got a showroom. You've got a life to show. And it doesn't take money. It just takes you unselfishly helping and doing Altar's open. Let's all stand. Give an invite. I love this miracle. I love the truth of this miracle. Never try to lead Jesus in your prayers. Never try to lead Jesus. Always let him lead you. Because once you hear from God, once you hear from God, It's as simple as, Tabitha, Kumai, arise. Once you hear from God, it's simple as, come forth. It's simple. God's a God of providence. God is a God of majesty. All you need is his okay. That's all you need is his okay. Altar's open.